Okay. All right, my dear friends from Illinois and from states across this great land of ours, I would like to introduce my friend and colleague, Sina Baram, ladies and gentlemen. He is a PhD candidate at uh, North Carolina State University, a consultant, and a bon vivant of great, great <laughs> renown. He will now instruct us on perspectives and advice on accessibility and universal design. Thank you very much, Sina Baram. All right, thanks everybody. As uh, Andy said, my name is Sina Baram. Just a quick thing on uh, Twitter, if you want to follow along, it's hashtag iLeadUSA, so definitely great to see those uh, conversations going. This is going to be the quietest I'm going to be on, 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 on Twitter for the next hour, so since uh, live tweeting during a talk is frowned upon. All right, so, um, and uh, my Twitter handle is at Sina Baram if you want to use that. You'll also notice um, that uh, I have hashtag A11Y, A11Y on the bottom of my slides, and uh, that's a numeronym. So we have a room full of librarians uh, uh, here, so uh, does anybody know what a numeronym is? Okay, so a numeronym is when you take a word like accessibility and you turn it into uh, the first letter, then followed by the number of letters we're going to remove, and then the last letter. So A11Y is accessibility because we've removed uh, C-C-E-S-S-I-B-I-L-I-T. And so uh, internationalization is I-18N, localization is L-10N, and you see this a lot on servers with really short file names from back in the day, but these days on Twitter because we like to conserve space. So if you want to learn more about um, accessibility or just participate in the conversation, you'll see me refer to this uh, A11Y on Twitter a lot, and I encourage you guys to, to join in that conversation. So um, uh, for those of you who uh, didn't see me walk up here with a cane or, or uh, see me doing that this week, uh, traveling around, I'm blind. Uh, a little bit more on that in a, in a bit, but just uh, only ground rule basically is to, um, you know, raising your hand doesn't really work so well, uh, nor does uh, nodding, so we're going to kind of dispense uh, with that. I know we've been holding questions till the end, but we can shut those out uh, when we get there. I'll be asking you guys some questions, and again, the whole nodding thing uh, doesn't, doesn't really work, so just shout out yay or yes or whatever affirmative or negative response uh, you'd like to do. Um, one other thing really quick before we get started, so uh, we've heard a lot uh, this week about failing forward and uh, you know trying new things and iterating and that's not just uh, that's not just for the folks who are the I leaders that's I think for for everybody um, or at least I'm making it that way and so uh, one of the things that I've done is instead of making this talk only about accessibility um, only about universal design I've put some personal stories into it that uh, affected me uh, things having to do with my experiences with librarians or uh, for example in a second about how I'm blind and so I hope that um, uh, helps a little bit but it's an experiment and um, you know if it doesn't work out then that's good advice for not rewriting the keynote uh, one day before you give it so all right so uh, this is mini me uh, this was I think seven or eight year old Cena um, and um, uh, I just have this up here uh, so that um, I can tell you a little bit about uh, basically, so I was born um, with some vision problems. I could see a little bit, like I could see enough to read some big print or get close to a computer, you know, that kind of thing, and, 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 and read uh, that way. I could um, uh, maybe read like 18 or 22 point font, especially if it was white on black. So I had a little bit of vision. This is up until the age of seven. So when I was uh, seven years old, I was, um, you know, uh, uh, playing uh, tennis. I was playing tennis against the backboard, you know, just kind of like hitting the ball against the backboard and, and returning the serve. And, and one time I, um, I missed, um, but my face didn't, and so uh, the ball hit me in the eye. And so, you know, retina was already probably loose or, or whatnot, and the, make a long story short, basically, uh, no light perception in my right eye. So I have no vision there. I have a little bit of vision enough to cheat by uh, out of the left, but for the most part, we can, you know, assume that I'm, I'm uh, mostly blind, or I'm, I'm, you know, functionally blind. I use a screen reader, something I'll talk about a little bit, and something that if you're uh, interested in, um, uh, I'll be talking about a lot and demoing in the web accessibility talk later today. Uh, I read Braille and use a cane to travel and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of the, the background of, uh, of uh, that whole thing. Um, so decisions uh, are really important to me. And um, you know, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about how decisions can influence how you feel. And also, uh, decisions can really influence how, how others feel. And, and your decisions can, can influence how others feel. Um, with respect to me, uh, you know, before we jump into this universal design stuff and this accessibility stuff, uh, just in a general sense, I wanted to tell you that you know, when I was like um, 
I think maybe eight, maybe nine years old. This is pretty, you know, this is after the whole tennis ball incident. I, uh, I remember being out on the, on the porch, we had this like wooden porch thing, and um, I remember making an active decision. And, and the active decision was, was kind of really simple. I mean, like I don't claim to understand, you know, eight-year-old boy psychology, but it was basically, uh, I'm not gonna let the blind thing get me down, right? So it's like, that's it. That's just a flat decision that I made. I don't know why I made it. I have no insight into what brought it on or anything like that. I think it was sunny, that's about it, you know? Um, but I just remember making that active decision. And I, I have, have kept that decision, and I've, I've basically you know, lived my life by, by that decision, and so like, you know, I'm not upset about it, I love talking about it, you know, if you have any questions, that's totally cool, we can ha talk about that after the, after the talk, or at the bar, or whatever. Um, but uh, that's just a decision that I remember making, and um, I personally feel that by making that decision about that particular obstacle, or that particular perceived challenge, um, you know, my life is better for it. So, what is universal design? Keep talking about this stuff, but what, is it, what does it really mean? So we've got a definition up on the screen, but the basic idea is that it's broad ideas that can be used not only for people with disabilities, not only with, with people without disabilities or the elderly, but basically to involve all audiences, to target all audiences when we design objects, places, things, services, buildings, whatever the case may be. And um, this is, uh, you know, it stemmed out of um, pretty disability-centric stuff from the, from the 60s, but then it, um, started evolving into more of a way of thinking about design and more of a way of thinking about user experiences. And so um, I'll talk a little bit more about it via uh, examples. So these are some things that, uh, this is the cliche slide. So if you talk about universal design, you always have the curb cut slide. So are folks here familiar with curb cuts? All right, uh, thank you for the verbal feedback, that's awesome. Uh, and so the, uh, you know, the idea here is that um, it's good to have a sloped ramp, uh, let's say you're a wheelchair user, uh, because hopping the curb uh, is not necessarily a great idea for things like safety or whatever. And so, you know, that's not a great idea, so why don't we uh, have, a, have a ramp? So that's fantastic. But this is not the, you know, folks in wheelchairs definitely make use of curb cuts. That's not the majority of folks who use curb cuts. The majority of folks who use curb cuts are parents with strollers, or people with luggage at the airport, or somebody with a grocery cart at a grocery store, etc. So it's an example of universal design in that we uh, made something that is uh, helpful for one particular audience, for a lot of different audiences. It doesn't take away from a particular audience. And so it's universally um, a good thing. Now, there was a problem. The problem is they were originally smooth. So then we have blind people like walking into the middle of the street. Well, that's not good, right? I mean, unless if you don't like blind people and then we should combine that with electric cars and, you know, problem solved. But, um, but assuming that, you know, I like myself pretty good, so uh, I want to stay around. So how can we fix this problem? Well, it's very simple. We don't take away the curb cut. We're like, oh, well, you know, let's just forget about the, the wheelchair users or the people with strollers or whatever. We add, we iterate. And this is, you know, a theme we've heard this week as well. And the way we iterated as a society was we put bumpy stuff on it. So you guys have seen the bumpy, uh, it's called foot braille colloquially. Uh, uh, foot braille on, on, on curb cuts, the bumpy stuff? Yes. All right, so that is, uh, there's no secret messages, by the way, I, I checked. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, that's foot braille. And so we, we just added a little bit of texture. You can tell with your cane, you can tell with your feet, whatever. But uh, it also is then still usable by somebody with, uh, you know, a, a wheelchair or a stroller or so on and so forth. So we have a couple of things here. We have an electric toothbrush. So again, is this, an, like, who here uses an electric toothbrush? Okay. Who here uses a manual toothbrush? I do. Who here totally doesn't care about their teeth? <laughs> All right, you, we should, you should look into that. Um, so uh, basically, um, the idea here is that it's not only uh, you know, a laziness thing or an efficiency thing or a good thing like hygien hygienically, but also imagine having a, a particular mo mo uh, motor impairment or uh, maybe you have a temporary disability, you've injured your wrist or uh, arthritis or anything along those lines. Uh, this idea that there's something that's moving and um, you know, it makes the, the motion easier and it helps you uh, is, is something that's, that's fantastic. So it's an example of universal design where you might not think that it is. Um, the other one is, uh, let's say, a talking pill bottle. So this is coming out more and more. Um, certain pharmacies have it now, and basically there's a button on the pill bottle and has the ability to record a few seconds of audio, okay? And so that's great, you know, so again, if you can't read the bottle, great, we don't have a lot of space for Braille, so that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but what if you're in a foreign country and maybe the pharmacist speaks English? So that's helpful in that situation. 
situation as well. What if you don't have your contacts on, uh, in or your eyeglasses on in the morning? It can be helpful in that situation as well. So it's an example of maybe it's specifically for somebody who's blind originally or for another disability, but it has um, uh, benefits for all user groups. And this is something that uh, you're going to kind of hear again and again. That's the recurring theme, right? Um, the last one here is a light switch. So you guys remember the old light switches? It was like a little nub that came out and you would push it up and down to turn on the lights? Okay. So now you've seen the new ones, right? Like the more rectangular ones, right? Okay. And so that's, that's actually kind of a big deal, right? Because if you, let's say you, you don't have uh, all five fingers or manipulating something really small is kind of difficult. And it's also a smaller target too. Um, so maybe you're just low vision. You're not blind or anything, but you're low vision and you know, it's harder to see that. So uh, having that rectangle is fantastic. It's also lower, um, uh, you need l less physical force to hit it. And you can actuate it with other parts of your body. You can hit it with your nose if you're in a hurry or maybe your elbow or whatever. So it doesn't require uh, a traditional, um, you know, it doesn't enforce upon you a traditional uh, kind of physical interface or physical way of interacting with it. Does that, does that all kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. So, decisions matter. Um, revisiting, you know, revisiting this and, uh, uh, you know, going over how your decisions uh, matter to, to other people as well. But uh, first, there's a quote here. Uh, this is actually my favorite quote. Um, actually, it's probably one of my favorite quotes, period, but it's definitely my favorite quote by Maya Angelou, which is that people will, or I've learned uh, that people will forget what you've said, people will forget what, you've, uh, what you did, but people uh, never forget how you made them feel, right? And, and I've definitely found this to be true uh, in, in my life as well, and I try to apply this when I, uh, when I work with technology. And I don't always succeed, but it, I, I feel like it's a really good goal to strive for. And I feel like, you know, we're going to talk about these seven principles in a second, and we're going to talk about accessibility, and if you come to the web accessibility talk, I'm going to talk to you about stuff like labeling images. And that stuff matters, don't get me wrong, that stuff's important, it makes a difference in people's lives. But those are specifics. And from a general point of view, I feel like this, to me, captured the heart of kind of the message I wanted to send. Um, so a couple of stories here. So this is my one bad librarian story, okay? So don't shoot the messenger. Um, but this is my, and, and I, I, I have like 200 good ones, so I think that speaks for itself. Um, and, uh, but I remember being five years old, I, and I think, I think it was five or six, I think this was before the tennis ball thing. Um, and I remember going to the library to get a library card. And uh, I was with my mom, and uh, one of the things I had to do was sign my name on um, either the card or on a piece of paper. I don't, I don't remember what, um, but I just remember I had to sign my name. And I remember, like, obviously, you know, I had, like, five-year-old kid, had vision problems, you know, that didn't work so well, right? Um, because I could see a little bit, and so, you know, I kind of, we didn't know anything better. Um, but anyway, so I didn't get the card, right? Like, she didn't give it to me, right? And I know, right? I know, I know, like, that's, yeah. Um, but it's, it's okay. Um, and, uh, like, I, uh, I remember how that made me feel, right? Which is essentially not good, <laughs> you know, to summarize it. Um, but going back to that first decision I made, you know, the thing that I'm not gonna let this really get me down, I, I've, I've thought about this like three times. I thought about it when it happened. I thought about it at a previous iLead because I was telling some librarians about it. They were about to go on a witch hunt. And then I thought about it when I was, was making this keynote. And, and, and that's it. This is just not something that, you know, I'm not bitter about it or anything, but I remember that you know, looking back on it, reflecting on it, it, it is uh, important because as librarians you are uh, in, in positions where you can definitely help people grow or, or, or have that effect on people. So I just wanted to share that story. There's no, there's no real moral to it, it's just, it's just an experience that, that I wanted to share. So another story about how other people's decisions have really, um, really affected me was when I was a kid, um, we had, um, so I, I, I read a lot, right? And you can, you can tell the, the nerds early. And, um, you know, you, we had these uh, books on tape. They would come in these green containers, and uh, we heard Secretary White talk about the, the, the next version of that program. It's digital now, but back in the day, it was on cassettes. And these cassettes were awesome, by the way. They were like, you know, four-track cassettes. You could fix six hours of audio on it. If you want to geek out about, like, analog audio, come see me after the talk. We'll, we'll have a good time. Um, but, you know, this was great. So I would get, like, I read every Star Trek book the Library of Congress of the United States has. It was awesome, right? But the way I got there was like I would order one or two books and then, uh, you know, you'd go to the mailbox. I was so excited to check the mail and I'd, I'd go and I'd get it and um, 
uh, I'd be done, you know, because like I, I was, you know, I had nothing else to do, so I would just read. And so then uh, I had to wait for more books to come back. So I'd call, the, there was a 1 800 number. Um, that was their first mistake. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, so I would call and I'd be like, yeah, you know, hi, you know, like geeky Cena, geeky nine year old Cena. And uh, like, you know, can I get some more? And so then eventually they started like upping my limit. It was like three, then four, then like you can have six books at a time, eight books at a time, ten books. At, then like the mailbox couldn't hold anymore, so the mailman got mad. And, you know, it was just like, you know, this was, this was a thing, right? But I remember what was really cool was after a while I started noticing something. Um, they were sending me books automatically. And it wasn't only the Star Trek books because they ran out. Uh, and so they started sending me these like books by this Dickens guy and by this Shakespeare guy and by this Alexander Dumas guy. And um, also they must have thought I was a teenage girl because later Judy Bloom, which was really odd. But we'll move, <laughs> <laughs> move on past. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Um, so, uh, you know, this was really interesting though and, and it was like somebody making this decision like almost like this this cool like fairy godmother fairy godfather sort of thing just sending me books automatically and you know I choose to parse that in one of two ways you know the the first way is like wow this kid's like really we can see in the computer he's like reading more and more and more he returns them back all the time so we got to encourage this we got to really foster this and the second is man if that kid calls me one more time <laughs> all right so I'll, I'll leave that to you but I just remember that really having a, a big impact on me all right, so separate but not equal. This is kind of like civil rights language from um, 40 and 50 years ago, but it applies to the accessibility space as well, right? So these are some things that kind of, um, you know, they're decisions that other people make that, that, that the matter. Um, and uh, it's the call us and we'll help you principle, you know, the idea that, okay, well, we know our website's not accessible or, or, or we know there's, you know, not a X, Y, and Z that we need to do for accessibility reasons, but, you know, call us and we'll help you. The intention is good, right? We've recognized there's a problem, but, you know, the, the implementation is bad. And the reason the implementation is bad is because it's not inclusive, right? It's not uh, actually something that is done with everybody else. It's a separate thing. And so the idea here is that whenever you're designing anything, regardless of disability stuff, handicap stuff, physical stuff, whatever, inclusion, I personally feel, is always the best policy. Not, uh, not excluding a group for any particular reason, even when you're trying to help them, I think is a really good motto to have. And we can maybe talk a little bit more about that. Um, a text-only version, I'll talk more about this during the web accessibility talk, but basically this is the idea of, uh, th this is something that um, was pretty popular in the 90s and early 2000s and should have died there, <laughs> but it didn't. Uh, the idea basically being, you know, click here for a text-only version, right? And, and that's just uh, not, again, the same principle as above, it's a separate version, right? So, and again, in museums, you'll see specialized interfaces off to the side. My, my company, Prime Access Consulting, one of the things we have the, the privilege of doing is I get to work with amazing people at museums. And I'll tell you a little bit about those projects later in the talk, but uh, this is something that we definitely uh, are, are not cool with. And, and, and just like getting museums to realize, no, we don't need a special interface off to the side. We just need to make the basic exhibit accessible. We need to make the main thing accessible and inclusive. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So the seven principles of uh, universal design. This is uh, from a, the uh, Center for Universal Design at uh, NC State. Um, I'm gonna do something I've never done before. Uh, I'm gonna make a sports reference, which is really weird for geeks, but um, a friend recently got me into basketball and the Wolfpack is in the Sweet 16, so that's all I'm gonna say about that. But, uh, so go Wolfpack. So we're gonna go over these seven principles. So equitable use, this is principle one, equitable use. Uh, can users with different functional limitations and abilities uh, get an equitable experience, right? So it's not always the same experience, but I mean, obviously, right, if they can't see, it's not going to be the identical experience, but can they get an equitable one, right? And that's, you know, that's sometimes hard to, um, hard to define, um, but it is, uh, it involves creativity, it involves thinking about your audience, and it involves, it, it involves involving your audience, and actually getting folks with disabilities to test whatever you're making, and this isn't only a website, or a video, or a, uh, an exhibit, it's, it's, it's really anything, maybe just content, for example. Um, the image you see here is uh, a wind exhibit prototype, the, um, this is from the Museum of Science up in uh, Cambridge, Ma Massachusetts, uh, up in Boston, and um, these are awesome folks, by the way, amazing museum, if you're ever in the area, uh, like call me. I mean, you, you should you should go there. Um, and um, basically, this is uh, turbines that are generating electricity. The real the real wind turbines that are on the roof and hanging off the side of the building. And they're visualizing the data. Okay, so they're visualizing the data. They've got a bar chart. That's a really great way to visualize some data, right? Um, and uh, pretty visual interface, right? So then we have like a blind fifth grader walk up to this thing. Well, I mean that's that you know like 
she's basically screwed, right? I mean, what are you going to do? Touch the glass? It's smooth. Thanks. Awesome. So what are you going to do about that? So what you do is um, there's a lot of things you can do. One of the things we did is we knew that the interface was pretty simple because it didn't change from screen to screen that much. So we put a tactile overlay on it. You don't have to, but in this particular, sen in this particular uh, uh, presentation, it, it made a lot of sense to do that. So we just put some, some raised lines on the screen. It was still a touch screen, but we just made sure it lined up with the pixel boundaries of the interface. And that let uh, uh, the, a blind visitor know where the grid lines on the graph were. And we also sonified the information. So sonification um, is an idea that simply is the, the way of using non-speech audio to transfer data, right? So non-speech audio is things like sound. So uh, you guys remember a parabola from math, a, a u, like y equals x squared. So uh, you can go pew, right? And so this is mono, so that doesn't work so well. But anyway, pretend I was panning from right to left. Um, and uh, just use your imagination. Um, uh, and so the idea there is that you map values to, to pitch. And uh, basically, you can uh, transfer particular graphs that way. And uh, this is uh, really cool stuff. So you can do stuff like that. So we did, we did that as well. We explained the data points as you touch it. And so now it's this interface. It's the same interface that everybody else is using. This stuff's just running in the background, OK? So this, this blind fifth grader, fifth grader walks up to it. Her friend, her sighted friend, who uh, took the bus over with her, uh, they're having the same experience. So when they're on that bus ride back to school or back home, they're talking about the same experience, and she's included in whatever that experience was. She didn't have to go use something separate off to the side or some audio tour off to the side. It was the same thing. All right. Number two, flexibility in use. So can visitors react with the, interact with the information in a variety of ways, all right? Uh, this is the idea of multimodal or multimodality, using different modalities to convey the same piece of information. Don't ever just say something one way. Don't, don't ever say one thing one way. All right, it, it, it's, it's not a good idea. Uh, convey your message in a variety of different ways, whether that's with audio, with text, with moving pictures, with color. You know, some people think, oh, well, I shouldn't use color because then somebody with color blindness can't, it, it, you know, that's not, that's not a way of thinking about it. Remember, we want to add, we don't want to subtract. So use color, but also use other ways of making sure somebody using a screen reader like I do can access that information. We'll talk more about that in the web accessibility talk if you want to. I don't mean to keep plugging my talk, by the way. I'm sorry about that. It's just, it will be, it will be covered there, though. Um, and uh, the, the, the image you see here on the screen is um, a, uh, from a workshop uh, called SIMI, Creating Museum Multimedia for Everyone. This was an awesome workshop uh, that I, I had the privilege of attending. And what we did there was we uh, basically uh, got together with computer scientists and uh, sonification folks and uh, uh, um, exhibit designers and people from museums, evaluators. It was really great. And uh, we basically geeked out for a week. And the first couple of days were uh, kind of theory stuff and everybody gave a talk. And then the last couple of days were more like a hackathon. And so we made this thing. I mean, this thing was like, it involves super glue and pieces of wood that were lying around. And how can we get something to send messages just to the computer, I know we'll strap a, mice, a mouse to the bottom of it, and, and so on and so forth. And what it is, is basically a way of exploring uh, data in, in, a, in a more haptic way, in a, in a, in a touch-oriented way. So we've got the screen. It's got some data. This isn't the wind turbine stuff. This is for um, uh, Hall of Human Life was the, the one we were prototyping. So they had all these sensors about your biology. Like you could jump, you know, and it, it gave you how much force you exerted. Uh, you could put your hand on a, a what is that, a Peltier sensor. Uh, and and, and um, you, you could tell the temperature, and, and you know you could measure your foot size, that kind of stuff, right? And then you could see the, the data points on the graph for the previous 99 people that were there at the museum as well. So you have like these 100 data points, where do you fall in that curve, right? And so this involves something called point estimation. How can you find your point in, in all of that data, right? And uh, the way we came up with this is we said, okay, well, we need to let them know approximately where they are. How can we do that if they're, you know, if they're touching the screen? That can get really messy really fast because there's so many points. You can only move your finger in so many small increments. So I had this idea, and we, we all did, where like you could move something left and right and up and down, right? The x, y coordinates. You could move that. So we had that, that, so that stick is that's sticking up, and you could move it along a rod. And that rod would then move vertically as well, kind of like how a, a 3D printer works in, in XY plane. And then um, we also put the grid lines down, so we had that. The braille is made out of uh, like super glue. This was like super low tech stuff. And then I, I wrote some code along with somebody else who had a sonification library there, and we came up with this thing. And it didn't take us that much effort. Um, it took a lot of coffee, but it didn't take a lot of effort. And uh, it was it was a lot of fun, and it didn't cost a lot of money at all. And and just, you know stuff that was lying around the museum. And the point. 
Look, it's it's a museum of science, all right. So I believe the the the, the standard Twitter message is because of science, um, and so. Uh, this was just something that, to me, brought home the idea of, uh, you know, we made something that was accessible to somebody who couldn't move their hand a lot. That thing was really easy to move. Uh, somebody who can see, uh, if they couldn't hear, they could look at the data on the screen, et cetera, et cetera. And it was something that we put together, we cobbled together in a day or two, uh, just from stuff lying around and just from writing some code. And so if you think about this stuff up front, it's not that hard to do. I'm not going to say that it's always easy, and you're not always going to get 100% coverage. That really isn't the point. The point is to iterate and think about this audience and think about all of the audience, uh, you know, all of your audiences, and then just, just work on that. All right, so perceptible information. Can uh, visitors access and interact with the information um, regardless of or independent of a sensory disability, all right? And so this can be a temporary sensory disability. We're talking about museums in, in this particular uh, set of slides, and, you know, uh, museums have uh, uh, lots of um, uh, rather boisterous children running around uh, uh, screaming. And uh, you know that's not always great for, like, let's say, using a speech interface, right? So this idea, um, this principle of uh, you know, perceptible information is basically, look, just put a volume knob on it. This isn't hard. If you're going to make something that, that outputs audio, put a volume knob on it. Offer a headphone jack. And, and then, all right, maybe there's some loud uh, children behind you in a museum uh, you know, on Sunday afternoon, but on Tuesday it's quiet. The volume can be adjusted. It really is that simple. This isn't very complicated complicated stuff. Um, the other thing we see here is just, you know, volume control uh, and a tiltable screen. So let's say somebody's in a wheelchair or maybe somebody is uh, not, you know, five or six feet high. Uh, they're, like, let's say, four feet high or three feet high. They can tilt the screen for, for a better angle of view. Um, again, just this idea of flexibility, right? Oh, one, one last thing that I didn't cover here was uh, the uh, cell phone offering voice by, you know, turn by turn um, directions in the car. Uh, for, you know, who here uses like GPS when you're, when you're driving? Okay, and like if you use it on your phone, you know, you really shouldn't be looking at that, right? For a variety of reasons. I mean, humans really shouldn't be driving cars, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> that's a whole other story. Um, but, uh, you know, in the meantime, while you guys go do that, um, like, you really shouldn't be looking at the screen, you know, eyes on the road. And so having this voice interface is not only helpful, again, to somebody who can't see, but somebody who might be functionally or temporarily blind, okay? All right, tolerance for error. So um, this is uh, the, the idea that, you know, we, we make complicated interfaces sometimes, or we make complicated things. I mean, this could be, the, when I say complicated, it, it doesn't necessarily mean programming or, or coding. This could just be like maybe uh, something that's sitting on a shelf showing the planets and uh, maybe can be configured in a different way, anything along those lines. And, um, you know, uh, it, it needs to be tolerant of error. Users are going to do things that you don't expect. Whenever you make something, um, I want you to take any expectation you have that the user will do anything, whether you're making a website, whether you are uh, uh, making a piece of content that's going to go up on a blog, whether you're uh, you know, designing a program or an app or anything like that. And I want you to take any expectation you have on the user and expect that They'll do all of those things, and then they'll do the opposite of all of those things as well, okay? And then they'll do a lot of things that you've never even conceived of. Um, and that's just the reality of the world we live in. And so instead of trying to control for that or fight against it, we should make sure that the stuff we're making is tolerant of errors and is able to uh, be adaptive. So the idea I have here is a you know, it's a Coke machine. Uh, it probably should be rebranded to, to Pepsi, given the, that's, that's all right. And so let's say you want, for example, a Diet Coke. So if you want a Diet Coke, then what you need to do is, you know, put some money into the machine, right? And, uh, it, you know, maybe you don't put enough money, so, all right, it, it won't give you the Diet Coke. If you uh, do put in enough money, it'll, you push the button, it'll give you the Diet Coke. If you put in too much money, maybe it won't return your change. That's not a bug. That's a feature uh, for the Coke company. Um, but, you know, the idea there is that it's a pretty simple device, uh, but it's uh, something that is pretty tolerant of error. I have to be careful when I give this example in front of a tech audience. They, you know, inevitably there's like three hands that go up and they're like, you know, this is how you hack a Coke machine. I get it, guys, but that's not the, you know, <laughs> let's, let's move on. All right. So low physical effort, right? So we talked about this a little bit um, uh, before uh, with, for example, the light switches and an electric toothbrush. But um, think of um, uh, think of double doors, right? So, so first let's think about the doorknob. The doorknob is one of the worst inventions of mankind, 
all right? So it has no affordances when you look at it. Like, it, it's round, so I probably turn it. But then does a door open outwards or inward? Um, do, you know, maybe sometimes there's these button things on it, which are like the lock or whatever. You know, it's just, it's just this, like, really kind of not very good thing, all right? It's totally IMHO, right, in my humble opinion. Um, and uh, they, uh, you also have to use a lot of muscles to, to actuate a doorknob, right? I mean, think of all the muscles you use to, to turn your wrist like that, to turn a doorknob and to grip a doorknob, et cetera, et cetera. So an alternative to that is a push, a push door, right? A push bar door. Um, usually, you know, it's a bar. It usually says push on it, which is awesome. Uh, you can push it from. Uh, usually, the bar is is pretty low. So let's say you're a wheelchair user, you can still actuate it. Maybe you have groceries in your hand. You can hit. You know, you can kick it open, or you can hit it with your hip. So just by changing something as subtle as a doorknob, or uh, uh, you know, how we how we use and interact with the door, we can think about uh, universal design in this way and, and low physical effort. And this is isn't only for, um, uh, for, for physical uh, environments, even though it is like you know, physical effort. You can think of this in the digital world as well, thinking of not making the user go through 70 different tabs just to, to get at a piece of information, whereas they could have just clicked on it. And well, you know, there's, there's all sorts of accessibility implications for this as well. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So the seventh and final uh, principle of universal design is size and approach, uh, size and um, approach for use. So, so this is the idea that, um, you know, if you are a wheelchair user and you've got crowded shelves or crowded aisles, uh, leaving room to maneuver is great. Or maybe somebody has an assistant um, in a digital interface. Think about making a touchscreen interface and making the buttons large enough to be touchable. And remember, as your hand approaches the touchscreen, you occlude what you're about to hit, right? Because your thumb or your pointer finger is going to occlude it. It's going to block what you're about to hit. So thinking about these things in terms of design is really important, not just in the, in the, in the physical world. All right. So, what is accessibility? I've mentioned it a lot, but you know, what what is accessibility? So, um, I've got a definition here that I've cobbled together over the years. Others have uh, contributed to it, uh, and and I feel this this sums it up uh, uh, reasonably well, um, which is the ability of all people to use a product, place, service, uh, regardless of functional limitation. All right, and um, to me, uh, this is uh, this is the field that I work in. Right, this is the thing that I try to improve: the accessibility of something. Can something be uh, accessed or reached by all audiences. And universal design is a fantastic way of, and inclusive design is a fantastic way of improving accessibility. So, burden or boon, right? Can this stuff, you know, this stuff can be viewed as a burden, it's a compliance issue, I gotta do it because of X, Y, and Z reason. Um, and, and you can view it that way, and, and that's one of those decisions that you can choose to make. Um, you know, that's both a decision internally that you're making about yourself and also a decision you're making that affects others, right? But I, I feel like there are so many opportunities that come when you think about this stuff. There's so many benefits that emerge as a result of thinking about accessibility and thinking about other audiences that you haven't predicted might interact with anything that you're making, that to me it's really, it's a boom, right? So you can look at it as a hindrance or a compliance issue, but to me I, I really think that, um, you know, it can unlock a lot of growth, so. All right, uh, this is uh, Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple that took over for Steve Jobs. Um, a couple of, uh, oh gosh, I don't know, maybe it's been more than a year. Yeah, it's been about a year and a half or so now, I think. Um, he was at a stockholder meeting. This was uh, um, a, uh, one of the, like, their annual or quarterly stockholder meetings for Apple. And uh, one of the institutional investors, you know, these are guys who buy hundreds of thousands, if not millions of shares, um, you know, was giving him a hard time saying, listen, Tim, you know, uh, great, you're profitable, da 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 da, but, you know, we could make another 2% on the bottom line. You're doing this green energy stuff. What is up with that? You know, um, and, and, you know, just, just cut it and, and, and throw that towards the bottom line. And Tim, you know, responds, he's like, well, it's the right thing we do, right thing to do at Apple. We want to leave the world a better place. And the guy, keeps pushing him and pushing him, right? And, and it, this is like the only time I think that anybody knows Tim Cook to lose his cool in public. And he basically, is, he basically looks at the guy and says, look, when we work on making our devices accessible to the blind, I don't consider the bloody ROI, right? the return on investment. Uh, it just goes in the right thing to do column. So this is another way of looking at accessibility. By the way, when he said that, I had to take back half the bad things I ever said about how. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's all right. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to do it. And, and so the idea here is that, look, you know, uh, this stuff uh, is, is the right thing to do. It has a lot of benefits. This hasn't just been a cost center for Apple. This has actually gotten them a lot of benefits and it's improved other related technologies like Siri, like text-to-speech, like other things as well. And uh, it just depends on how you choose to, to, to look at this stuff. 
So this is my one obligatory slide, just so I can do my duty by you. I hate this slide. I hate talking about this aspect of accessibility, which is the legal side of things. There's plenty of other folks that I'm happy to introduce you to that will be um, you know, uh, more than delighted to charge you hundreds of dollars an hour to talk to you about the legal compliance issues of accessibility. But I, I believe that uh, we can get there through a lot of other means. Sometimes this is necessary. So legally, it's the law. You know, 508 is part of the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's also 504 that sometimes comes into play. Uh, 508 is recently getting refreshed. What that means is that what the law considers to be an accessible website is going to be based off uh, this, these wonderful sets of standards I'll be talking about later today called the uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG for short. And, uh, and that's fantastic, um, WCAG 2.0 to be exact. And so uh, it is the law, but uh, I don't want to concentrate on that too much. If you have questions, though, I, I will be happy to to try to answer them. Um, there's also the UN Convention uh, for Persons with uh, uh, Disabilities. Uh, this, uh, I believe we're now a signatory. I kind of lost track. We waffled back and forth so long. We, we, we spent a long time being the only first world country not to have signed the thing out of like you know 170 countries in the world. Uh, but I think we're finally a signatory on, on, on that as well. Um, you know, end this slide with, look, um, librarians to me are the good guys. And you guys have so many better reasons to work on accessibility and universal design than the legal reason. So let's do it. Um, so um, advantages, not obstacles, right? So this is the idea that um, there's a lot of technology out there that can be viewed as, oh man, that'll like totally not work if you're blind, right? And, and I have a different way of looking at that. I, I like to look at new technology and I like to think of it as, oh, um, this is like totally cool. I could do some really neat stuff with this and this could actually enable not only the digital world, but enable the physical world as well. And I'm pretty, pretty passionate about that. So one of those things that I'm really passionate about is 3D printing. And um, are folks here familiar with 3D printing? Yes. Okay, yeah, and I love how that number just goes up every year. It's so cool. Um, and, uh, you know, so essentially, to me, I view this as transformative and as potentially transformative as, as like, you know, the internet or the printing press. And the reason I view it that way, and just a kind of a, you know, maybe a, a bold thing to say, is because uh, I, I think that when we combine something like 3D printing with the idea that you can download things off the internet and you combine it with the idea of free and open source software and you combine it with the maker, you know, the maker movement or the, the, the ability to um, have communities of practitioners that, that enjoy sharing designs and how to make things and sharing information, uh, hack the planet, um, then, uh, you know, that's like, that, that's a really powerful thing. A part of your dishwasher breaks, I mean, okay, just just print another one, and um, you know there was a, I was at a, a 3D uh, printing uh, unconference uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, this guy um, was loading his um, his uh, um, 3D printer onto a pickup truck. It's North Carolina; everybody has a pickup truck, and so you know you, you go there and. Um, uh, we get there, and he's like, "Dude, uh, guys, when uh, when I was loading it, I, I smashed the back of the 3D printer uh, into the side of the of the bed, and it totally snapped off." And uh, that's okay because the MakerBot is in the back printing its own replacement, right? And I just thought that was so cool, right? That's awesome. And he said, "By the way, I." thought I might be clumsy again, so I made it stronger this time. I went in, I edited the file, and I made it a little bit stronger, added a couple more supports, so hopefully next time it might not snap off so easily, right? So to me, that's like so just, that, that's amazing. That's really, really cool stuff. Um, it facilitates access, 3D printing can, to physical uh, information and physical objects. Maybe you have a precious artifact, or maybe you have an example of something, and uh, you want people to be able to touch it, not just put it behind glass, right? But uh, if they touch the real thing, you know, whether they're blind or not, you know, there's maybe like one of it in the world or it's really expensive or fragile or whatever, then, or, or dangerous to touch, for example, then it's not a good idea to let them touch that. So, all right, why don't you just 3D print that model of it? You can scan it with a laser. This is just not hard anymore. And you can, you know, what, 90 cents of materials cost? You want a really good quality one, $2.90 of materials cost? And you can, you can really then make a replica of something. Somebody drops it on the floor, I mean, you're out two bucks. And it, it's, it's just... Uh, not you know a big deal all of a sudden, but it is truly uh, transformative and really helpful to just a wide uh, a variety of people who otherwise wouldn't have been able to access that information or look at that thing or appreciate that thing. It can also be um, informative and it can also be uh, helpful for physical objects, for, for um, intellectual uh, uh, objects, like mathematical ones, for example. So I was in the lab. Um, 
when uh, this is, uh, I, I'm a candidate, a PhD candidate at NC State, as, as Andy said, and um, when I pretend to be a graduate student, uh, I show up there. And um, uh, I was having a conversation with a good buddy of mine, and he was, uh, he was saying, he was trying to explain this 3D shape to me. It's a 3D knot, it's a toroid that has no beginning and no end, it's roughly spherical, right, and it's kind of twisted itself like a pretzel, right? Totally makes sense, right? Yeah, hold on to that sense of confusion. So I was just like, I mean, you know, his name's Arpon. I was like, Arpon, I kind of know what you're talking about, but um, I'm not really getting it, you know? Uh, and then we looked it over at my desk and we're like, there's a 3D printer right there. Why don't we just print it? So we did. So he drops this in my hand. So, um, you know, I don't know if you can see this from uh, where you're sitting, but it's, it's a toroid. It has no beginning and no end. It's roughly spherical and kind of looks like a, like a pretzel, right? I mean, and, you know, I actually told him that after he printed it and put it in my hand. He's like, that's what I said. Um, but, you know, like, until you touch it, right, um, you're not going to get that kind of innate level of understanding, right? And you can actually take your finger and you can follow it through and see it has no beginning and no end. And that's just really cool to me. So this was just an awesome example of, okay, so there's this, uh, you know, concept that previously would have been really hard to explain, no matter how good or how, you know, good the, the manipulative was or whatever, and uh, we could just hit a button and download that file off the internet and hit print, and then I, I, I had that. So that to me is just really cool. So this shape is uh, DNA, right, the double helix. And I, I spent a lot of time trying not to be the stereotypical blind guy in accessibility. So I did, I mean, I did it all. Like I, I tried to go into like uh, privacy and law and bioinformatics, uh, uh, you, you just, you, you name it, uh, uh, kernel hacking and systems programming, like whatever, just anything other than accessibility stuff. Not gonna do that, right? And uh, well, that, that worked out great, yeah. So uh, I'm doing what I'm doing. But, um, you know, some things you can't change. But um, the, when, you know, I, I'd done research into this stuff. Like I could talk to somebody about DNA and, and about RNA and stuff like that, but I'd never actually touched the structure. So one of the, the second thing I ever printed on a 3D printer was this DNA spiral, right? And it's just, again, we're talking like 20 cents of plastic here. All right, this, this doesn't even take that long to print, but 20 minutes, maybe 22, something like that. And, uh, but it was awesome, right? Like you can touch it and then you can actually like take this model and you can actually give somebody a test. Like are the spirals going in the right way? Or is the, oh, what do they mean when they say a ladder? What do they mean when they say like a staircase or whatever? It, it's, it's awesome. And again, if this breaks, so what? Just print another one. Um, uh, this here, by the way, just out of curiosity, is the first thing I ever printed, which is a chain. And it was amazing to me because it printed and it has moving parts. I mean, how cool is that? So that was just really impressive to me. All right. So um, misconceptions about things like touch. Well, it's flat. There has no buttons, right? So how are you going to be able to interact with it? But you heard that story about how we uh, did all sorts of modifications to that uh, museum exhibit. I can use a, an iPhone because there's software on it. Again, uh, when, when Tim Cook's Tim Cook said when we make our devices accessible to the blind. So this iPhone, I can demo this for you guys, uh, you know, offline a little bit more. But it's basic, you know, basic iPhone. It's reading to me uh, all your wonderful tweets. Thank you for that. And it's talking a little fast. Um, I will slow down. Uh, Should have gone the other way, but that's okay. For 45, 40%. Okay, and three, seven, three, orientation lock, games fold, vision fold, hell. Right, I can swipe, I can interact with it, I can change the screen. And by the way, I get way better battery life than all of you people because I can turn the screen off and still use it, which is awesome. Um, so that's always cool. Well and done, <laughs> uh, but that's you know that's that's me using a touch screen, and and my my PhD research actually related to that, but doing that kind of stuff with graphs, doing that kind of stuff with maps, and and and, and graphical and spatial data. But the idea being that, um, you know, we might have these misconceptions about, oh, that's totally not going to work for a so-and-so audience, uh, but there, there's ways. There's ways of doing that. Um, so uh, augmented reality, right? So um, this is the uh, idea that um, it's, it's really visual, uh, you know, the kind of the only glasses that blind people wear are sunglasses. So like for that, you know, we have this, yes, all right, cool. So, you know, like this is the, kind of the stereotype, right? Like, so the only glasses blind people wear are sunglasses. This is really stereotypical, I'm taking this off. And um, <laughs> like, there's only so long I can, I can do that. I can't rock that. And um, so uh, essentially, like, that's, that's kind of the misconception, right? But this stuff has a lot of potential for accessibility. Something like Google Glass, although, you know, what, what is the latest? Uh, uh, Eric Schmidt said it's not dead, and somebody else said it is. So we'll see if that's still alive, um, like Google Reader, poor thing. Um, but 
like uh, basically the geeks in the room. Ah, oh, let's have a let's all have a moment for Google Reader. <laughs> uh, too soon, I'm sorry. Um, but essentially there's other technologies too. Microsoft's HoloLens, right? And this idea being that um, you can have um, these layered, uh, um, well, it's augmented reality, this layer of artificial reality that can layer on top of the visual scene or off to the side of it in the case of Google Glass. And, and that's great, that sounds really visual, but that's obviously helpful for a lot of disabilities. For example, captionings appearing under my lips as I talk for somebody who's deaf in real time, or uh, talking with a, uh, somebody in a, a different language like Spanish or German and having the English translation not only audible but also visually displayed, right? This is just, this is not hard stuff anymore. It's 2015, all right? We've got some of this working already. Um, and then we can talk about, okay, well, what if, like, what if you're blind? What are the advantages there? And you can think of a lot of them. Like, think of a networking event where you want to know who's around the room. I want to know who's, like, who's in the audience right now. Like, half of you have probably just left. It's okay. Um, and, uh, you know, so, like, I want to just tell that, right? And so I want to see, okay, Andy's sitting right there, right? And where's Anne sitting and things like that. Or maybe you shouldn't talk about your boss because they're, eight feet away from you. So, you know, these are the things that come up, right? And so you could have a little agent just whispering that in your ear. You wouldn't even have to wear earbuds like I'm doing right now to, to, listen, to, uh, to listen to these slides because you can use bone conduction headsets. So it would just sit right here and it would talk to you and both of your ears would be free, right? Talking GPS, similar thing. So there's a lot of potentials for looking at these different technologies. Yes, they're uh, maybe highly visual when you think about them originally, but then realizing, hey, this stuff can be you know, really kind of awesome for uh, accessibility and for enabling that physical world. All right, um, 3D and natural interfaces. Uh, you guys seen um, uh, Minority Report? Yeah. Tom Cruise movie? All right, so I've got the motion leap here, which is basically that interface. Not as good because, you know, Hollywood. But um, this is a, uh, a natural uh, user interface, an example of one. There, there's several others. Um, and uh, this is a, an interface. I can put this like, right here on my computer, right? So I've got it in front of me. And I can take my hands and I can like do an air piano and it will send those, those um, you know, there's an API, there's a way that a programmer can listen to this uh, or, or it actually even just control my mouse or my operating system with it. I can like do like this to switch windows um, or make a gesture to copy and paste. And you can imagine that, okay, well again, we're thinking this is pretty visual, but you know, if you're blind, you still have a proprioceptive sense. You still know where your limbs are in relation to your body. You still know what shapes you're making. And so you can imagine swiping through data instead of having to tab through it, right? Or, uh, you know, in a linear way. Because remember, you, you don't have a mouse that uh, you can, you know, really use functionally for, for, for doing that. So you could have nonlinear access to data when you're exploring data or you could come up with other interfaces like your uh, your hands are on your keyboard but you could make head gestures to do particular things so there's there's lots of ways of enabling um, different functional limitations somebody who might not be able to articulate all their fingers could use a three-dimensional uh, keyboard in which a word prediction and uh, letter prediction is actually um, dynamically being changed as they're making gestures so that they could communicate more efficiently this is not again this isn't hard stuff it sounds kind of sci-fi ish but really half the things I've said already exist and so uh, this is the kind of stuff that uh, gets me excited when I think of new technologies as opposed to just thinking, oh, that's like super visual or, oh man, like you can't see, so good luck using that or whatever the case may be. And I just wanted to sort of convey that sense of excitement to you and make you think uh, of that when thinking of a new thing as opposed to, to the challenges. So philosophy towards interaction. Um, the more input we can you know, gather from the environment, uh, the the richer interfaces we can make, the more concise and efficient interfaces we can make. Um, I really believe in this. I, I try to do this when I'm making technology or when I'm making anything that you know, users will be interacting with, right? Because I, I feel like that we sometimes have a really narrow expectation. Oh, users will only want to do this, or my audience will only expect this. And so just be dynamic about it. Be, be able to adapt. And I think that's not only, you know, I, I know I talk about interfaces here and users, and that's kind of the language that I always, I'm used to using with my peers. But really, this can also be applied to life. You know, just, uh, uh, you know, uh, Beck, for example, I think uh, is, 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 you know, one of like the deep thinkers I know and she's really good at like being receptive and like listening to you and you know that's something that I'm gonna try to work on is like just just being able to slow down a little bit and listen and so this principle to me sort of tries to encapsulate that um, by the way one other quick demo before we go on is this uh, this little example of universal design this is called the Bradley has anybody heard of this so this is a watch 
Um, it's a universally designed watch. It's kind of interesting. So there's talking watches. Don't get me wrong. I had some as a kid. Um, you know, they go, Ing! it's 2.34 p.m. It's really <laughs> annoying. It's like super annoying. Um, but this is a little different. This is made by a company called E1, uh, E-O-N-E, -E, and they're, um, they, they, they kick-started it first, and, uh, you know, they uh, um, uh, are, are now just selling them, and, and they have uh, other, uh, other uh, models of this. But basically, here's how this works. Instead of having um, a minute hand and an hour hand and you know, braille along the side, like a braille watch that you might have seen. There's two um, uh, balls. There's two magnetic. There's two uh, 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 ferrous uh, balls. So the magnet can actuate them. So the first ball is around the top, and the other ball is around the side, around the circumference of the watch. And that's the hour and the minute hand. And then what happens is that you can you can touch it, and you can tell where the time is because you know that's 12 o'clock, that's three, that's six, that's nine, so on and so forth. And the way that it moves the time, the way that it updates the time, is that there's a magnetic field inside of here, two magnetic fields, one for the hour and one for the minute. And so then, even if you move the balls around, they'll snap back, uh, due to the magnet, back into the correct time. So you don't affect the time. You know, Braille watches are kind of quantum mechanical devices because the act of reading them can sometimes change them. This is, uh, the geeks in the room, I love it. Um, and so, but this is, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you change it because it'll, it'll, it'll wiggle right back. Does that make sense? So that's the Bradley. This is named after uh, Brad Snyder, uh, who is a veteran that uh, went blind because of um, uh, an explosive device, and uh, then uh, came back and was a gold um, uh, a gold medalist in the Paralympics. And, and he's got a great story if you want to go on their website um, and, and, and read about that. But I just wanted to show you guys that as an example of something that you can use it if you can see, but you can also use it if you don't want to look like you're looking at the time in your meeting, right? Because you can touch it, right? And so it's, again, an example of universal design. So accessibility can be fun. Um, this is uh, two buddies of mine, Sassy uh, Outwater and, and Billy Gregory. Uh, Bill is an accessibility guy, works on websites and stuff like that. So he has this little catchphrase, I put the bill in accessibility. And uh, I know, it's, it's the kind of friends I have. And um, it, we made him this shirt. Uh, this was mainly an excuse to get him felt up at conferences. And so it has Braille on it, right? The shirt has Braille on it. And um, you know, there's, there's that portion of the shirt, and then here's the other portion of the shirt for the geeks in the room that has some HT pseudo HTML yeah. tags on it. And again, we put those in Braille as well. So he's got this Braille shirt that he wears to, to technology conferences. Good times. All right. Um, this really has nothing to do with accessibility. I just wanted to share this picture. So basically, um, you know, uh, if, if I really wanted to make a stretch, uh, I, I would say that, well, first of all, this is amazing. Skydiving is unbelievably awesome and everybody should do it. But putting that aside, um, the, uh, you know, the idea here, if we really want to stretch it, is that uh, it, it, it takes a, an interesting mindset to not be able to see and to jump out of a perfectly functioning uh, aircraft at 13,000 feet, um, relying on some guy you met two seconds ago to <laughs> pull, pull a parachute at the appropriate time and place. Um, but uh, you know, if I can do that, hopefully you guys can uh, maybe consider putting some labels on some images when you're making a website or, you know, the, that's, my, that's my shameless. <laughs> Uh, all right, so call to action. Um, think of all audiences, not just the ones you expect or the ones that you want, because inevitably they will encounter something that you're making. Okay? Um, view accessibility challenges as opportunities. We talked about that burden or boon thing earlier. This stuff can be fun, it's exciting. If you actually have questions about it, you know, ask me. I'm going to give my contact information out later. I, you know, tweet me. There's a bunch of people online that will help you. Just hashtag A11Y. It's a really great community. We actually refer to it as a tribe. It's a really great tribe of people. And so, uh, you know, don't feel like, oh, I don't know anything about it, so it, I, I should do nothing. You know, every little bit helps, and it's this idea of iterating. Um, Embrace new technologies. We talked about stuff like the, the, the leap motion and the, the, all of these other things that uh, 3D printing that can really help with accessibility um, and enabling all audiences. Um, and by the way, they also help raise awareness, right? Because when somebody, like let's think about children and they see one, let's say, a child with a disability interacting with something instead of not doing something, then that's a really great way of changing the mindsets of children because those people are going to go on to be adults and maybe think, hey, I'm designing a watch now or I'm designing something else. Maybe I should think back to that person I saw 
who was so benefited by the fact that somebody incorporated inclusive design into something that they were making. Um, spread the word, you know, just talk to your colleagues about it, uh, uh, take this message back to your libraries and your home institutions. Uh, the stuff really matters, and so the more people you talk about it, the more questions that might come up, and that's a really good thing, that's a healthy thing. And uh, then I have this quote by my Angelou up there again. You know, I, I know I covered a lot of information. We had the seven principles, and we had all of these specifics. But at the at the core, um, you know, if you if you take nothing else away from it, try to apply this to anything you're creating or anything you're doing. I feel like it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good guiding principle, whether we're talking technology or whether we're talking the the physical world. Um, this is my contact information. Again, I welcome you. Email me, call me, tweet me, whatever. All the ways the 21st century geek can be reached. I got it. So, uh, you know, go for it. And with that, I really thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to be seen as question guy. So, do we have any questions for Wait, wait. I just told them not to raise their hands, and now you're, you're going to totally kill that. Shout it out, guys. No, you I'm, got I'm, this. I'm helping. OK. We're, all right. we're, we're We've totally got this. <laughs> but go ahead, guys. Any questions at all? And we can quickly browse Twitter. I've got an invisible interface, so I can do that. So, you know, show or put up to the microphone your, uh, oh, sure. your audio feed, because it's so, fascinating. Sure. So uh, I've got it a little slow, because I was reading slides. But here's this. And let me turn the volume up. OK, there we go. So here, let me get this mic here. Sorry for the crinkling. OK, and um, this is how I use uh, a computer. So that's about 950 words a minute. And uh, I know that we have a speed reader in here, 780. Um, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you want to you get up to 950, you know, come see me. Um, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so this is, this is pretty fun. This is how I uh, interact with the computer. It's a screen reader. If you want to see more of this, um, there's going to be the web accessibility talk, and I'll show you how using this software, um, you know, some of the things that you have to think about with respect to accessibility when I'm using the software to read a WordPress website, when I'm using this to read an interface. So that's, that's, a, that's a screen reader. That's the short demo of a screen reader. Any questions or any on Twitter? Cena, I've got a question for you. Please. Uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, sort of best practices that you hear about accessible website design. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can run the tests and see if all parts of the document are available to JAWS or something like that. Sure. My question is, what are sort of your pet peeves when you're using those sorts of websites? What can we do as we're considering design of websites that is good design but also it's helpful in the universal direction? OK, so the question was, just to repeat it, uh, what are some of my personal pet peeves in terms of accessibility, uh, especially with respect to websites? Um, uh, you know, I know, of course, we can uh, look at the document and we can maybe run it with a screen reader. But one of my personal pet peeves is that is that basically yes. your question? Okay, so uh, shameless plug, but like that's totally the topic of my next talk. Uh, so I'll be going all of those in details. But I think the main thing is, if you think about accessibility when you're designing a website, it is so much easier. So you can think of this as an architecture problem. If you try to add a room onto a house when you're first building it, it's not that hard. You work with the architect. You have to pay a little bit more money, but you know the idea is very simple. We know how to add rooms to buildings. When we want to do that after we've got a family of five living there and we have all sorts of wiring, all the other things in place, it's a lot harder. So remediation is always harder than proactively designing things well. Um, that's the general response. The specific response is that, like you said, um, you can download an open source screen reader called NVDA. It's a fantastic open source screen reader. It's free. It runs in Windows. You can kind of hear what I hear. That's not a substitute for having somebody with a disability check your website because you know, you're know you not blind. You're not an active user of this. But it is a way as a developer that you can um, you can check your stuff. And then there's other services. There's a great service called Tenon.io, T-E-N-O-N.io, um, which is some automated accessibility checking. It's made by a buddy of mine named Carl Groves. And so there's, there's lots of things out there. There's accessibility toolbars, and there's the web content accessibility guidelines, of course. So we'll talk all about that in the future session. But you know, personal pet peeves, obviously unlabeled images, buttons that don't have labels on it, like, I don't know, is that the, uh, like, here's one for you. Is that the confirm the friend button? Or is that the reject the friend button? Now, you really want to label those, right? Because sometimes that doesn't work so well if you mess those up. Um, any other questions? Thank you for your question. Please. With, say, microformats and RDFA, mm -hmm. putting that data in the tags in the actual HTML5 page, 
that to me is throwing more modification in, in screen reader. What, have you encountered that yet? So Andy's question uh, revolves around technology known as the semantic web and, and uh, the idea of putting um, additional information within the HTML tags of a website. So without getting too technical, and we can we can geek out about this offline, um, the, the answer is actually, for the most part, that's not going to make a difference, right? Sometimes it can help accessibility, but for the most part, it won't be as part of the DOM, the document object model of the page. So what that means is that it actually won't get in my way, right? Depends on how you're doing it. But for um, you know, the majority, if it's just markup that is adding additional information, like a recipe, you can have, you know, measurement or you can have uh, the kinds of ingredients that, that are there so that a, a web crawler can come along and know what that stuff is. Um, that's really important. That's good to do. Uh, it can only really help accessibility. There's some specific ways that maybe it can't and we can go over those offline. Any other questions? And any on Twitter if somebody's monitoring? Okay. Well, guys, thank you. And by the way, brief uh, shout out to iLead. So again, I like this. This was something kind of new for me. I don't usually do the whole personal stories and everything. So thank you for making it such a comfortable environment for me to be able to do that. You guys are amazing. Thank you.